Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I do, uh, I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the library. I do want to mention a couple of uh, upcoming programs. Uh, as you know, we have a number of uh, ongoing uh, series, uh, including the uh, uh, Beyond the Gown series uh, on the First Ladies that we're doing, doing with the Pres Truman Presidential Library. Uh, and uh, uh, upcoming in that series, we have uh, uh, John Robert Green, who's been here before, uh, talking about uh, Betty Ford, uh, and that'll be on uh, Wednesday, June 19th. Uh, and obviously, I think most of you are aware of, of uh, Betty Ford's impact on the whole notion of the institution or the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the culture, if you will, of being a, a first lady. Uh, and, uh, and that should be very interesting. Uh, John Roberts, a, a fine historian. Um, we also uh, continue with our Legal Landmarks series, which we kicked off, we think, in the right fashion with uh, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor last week. Uh, and Earl Maltz will be talking about the, uh, uh, the Dred Scott decision, uh, Dred Scott and the Politics of Slavery, on uh, Wednesday, June 26th. Um, that'll be at the Central Library. The Betty Ford Lecture will be uh, at the Plaza uh, Library. And then two other programs uh, I want to mention. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, here uh, at Central, we have uh, 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 coming back for an encore presentation, he's been here before, uh, Zachary Carabell, who's uh, written a uh, number of books about China. He's written about the 1948 election, Harry Truman's election. Uh, he's a fine, popular historian. Um, he will be talking about China again. He's written a book called The Good News Is the Bad News Is Wrong about U.S.-China relations. It'd be interesting, actually, to have Jay Nordlinger and, uh, and Zachary talk about that, because uh, Jay's written about China and, uh, uh, and might have a slightly more skeptical view. Uh, and uh, as I would, I think, actually. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I'll mention upcoming uh, that I'll mention uh, is uh, on Tuesday, uh, uh, a week from uh, today, uh, next Tuesday, we have uh, Andrew Jackson O'Shaughnessy. Uh, and Andrew is the Saunders Director of the Robert Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at the Corcoran Department of History at the University of Virginia in association with Monticello. Um, <laughs> And I, I know Andrew uh, pretty well. He's the leading historian on staff, both at, uh, at Monticello and a great Revolutionary War era historian at the University of Virginia. Uh, and he'll be here talking about his new book, which is getting very good reviews, uh, The Men Who Lost America. It's about the British leadership. Um, and uh, you know, it may have been our view that we won it. Andrew, who is uh, English, will tell us uh, uh, that they lost it. Um, and, <laughs> And, and, and it's a, uh, you know, he's a wonderful historian. He has a very good sense of humor, so uh, uh, I look, look forward to that. I am really excited tonight uh, to be able to introduce to you Jay Nordlinger, who I've been reading and Henry has been reading for years. We, we, were, uh, uh, we were in swaddling, no, actually, he's, I'm, I'm a lot older than Jay. I was going to say I was in swaddling clothes when I start, first started to read him, but, um, uh, but I've been reading for many, many years. Uh, he's a senior editor at National Review, regular writer for National Review and the New Criterion. Uh, he's been a speech writer for George W. Bush. Um, and uh, is a culture, in addition to writing his, his uh, regular political uh, stuff for, uh, for National Review, uh, he's also a cultural critic of, of uh, great distinction, uh, particularly as a music critic, in my, uh, in my view, uh, covering classical music for National Review and uh, for the new Criterion and, and uh, City Arts. Um, I wore uh, tonight uh, my unicorn tie. I always look uh, for opportunities to, uh, to wear my unicorn tie, which I particularly like. Um, because uh, tonight's subject, and the subject of Jay's wonderful book, Peace They Say, uh, is the Nobel Prize and world peace. So I wore my unicorn tie because world peace and the unicorn are both mythical beasts. <laughs> um, now, I looked forward to reading Jay's book about the Nobel Prize because I thought, as I usually I, I, I get from, from his uh, uh, work, I, I thought not only would I get great pleasure out of this, but some guilty pleasure as he punctures political correctness. Um, and indeed, uh, I, you know, I, I've got that out of this book. I mean, after all, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, it has been uh, given to Rigoberta Menchu. Uh, the Nobel Prize uh, has been given to a lot of people you've never heard of, including two uh, Coolidge cabinet members. Think about that for a second. Um, and, uh, you know, and there, there is the wonderful story that I hope he'll, he'll tell, if not, I'll ask him at, at the end about Sakharov, 
uh, a genuinely deserving uh, uh, of the, uh, the Peace Prize, uh, getting, the, getting the prize, and then 10 years later, uh, the man who, uh, who was in charge of something uh, called something like uh, you know, inter international uh, uh, physicians to, to prevent the United States from winning the Cold War, uh, a guy named Chazov, who signed the order, uh, 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 you know, persecuting Sakharov, uh, himself representing this international group, uh, getting the Nobel Prize in 1985. So, you know, one thinks about this, uh, and 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 one. I was looking forward to reading this book, and and just having a high old time, as Jay Nordlinger would would uh, would puncture the group that. You know, right after uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt said, you know, we should carry a big stick, uh, and was sending the fleet, uh, the white fleet around the world, uh, got the Nobel Prize. Or Woodrow Wilson, uh, who said, right is more precious than peace. Two years after he said that, as he declared war, uh, was received the Nobel Prize for peace. Um, you know, I thought this will be a fun read, and uh, indeed it is. Uh, and 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 there there are great witty uh, moments uh, uh, puncturing some of the uh, 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 how shall I say the pretentiousness of uh, of of the prize and the failures of the prize to be awarded to people like Gandhi uh, for instance um, and uh, and maybe making a little bit of uh, uh, of uh, of fun of uh, some of our recent uh, American receivers of the prize. Uh, Vice President Gore and, uh, uh, and, and President Obama, who, I, it, it, Jay does the, the math on this, they, they give the prize for the previous year's work, and, uh, and, that's the, and, and, as the, and, they, and they, they have their meetings at certain times and then, and then announce the prize and whatnot. So President Obama actually got the prize for something like eight days, I believe it was, of the presidency. Um, but uh, so I thought I thought this would would, would be a lot of fun, and it, and, it, and it was, except for this, <coughs> except for this. Actually, what Jay does is with great nuance uh, to tease out uh, some of the importance uh, of, of what the the Nobel Prize Committee has done as well. Uh, he, it, though, though I, I was prepared to, to find a lot of fun in Teddy Roosevelt getting the, the Nobel Prize. He, he did get it uh, for, uh, for, uh, for work uh, in ending the Russo-Japanese War, but also, and maybe Jay will talk about this, I hope he will talk about it, his speech, uh, given sometime after the actual ceremony, uh, is one of the best speeches. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and he talks about uh, some figures that you might not have heard of that I hope he'll mention in, in, in his talk, such as Osiecki, who was uh, uh, a, uh, a German who was being held in a Nazi prison. Uh, and, and then uh, towards the end of the book, he talks about something that's very, very topical, Liu Xiaobao, uh, the, uh, the first uh, Chinese to get the, the Nobel Prize for Peace, who of course got it while he was in jail. The Chinese wouldn't let him come to the ceremony. And who, in a sign of, be interesting to ask this question of Zachary Carabell tomorrow night, uh, in a very deliberate sign, the Chinese, the, as the President of the United States was meeting uh, with the uh, leader of China, Xi Jinping, uh, a couple of days ago, what, what was the signal they sent to the world? They arrested Liu Xiaobao's brother-in-law uh, and put him in jail. Um, and, and so in, in this way, the prize becomes uh, uh, maybe, maybe more important. And, and, uh, and though I took, you know, I, I laughed when President Obama got the, uh, the Nobel Prize after eight days in office. Um, uh, it, the, the, the ending of the book is, is fascinating, and I hope Jay will talk about that because he quotes from uh, President Obama's speech, and I changed my mind a little bit about, if not the awarding of the prize, at least about President Obama's uh, response to it. But mainly what I want to tell you about Jay Nordlinger is that he's a wonderful writer. Uh, this is a great book, I think. It, it, is, it is witty, as I expected it to be. It's also nuanced. And you know something? He sort of puts the nobility into the Nobel Prize with this book. Well, thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. I, I don't even feel like speaking. Uh, <laughs> that seems almost enough. Uh, but I'm, I'm so glad to be here. I'm <clears throat> so glad that this library exists. I. Uh, it's wonderful to see a grand public library downtown for there to be an author series that I said earlier was like a glorious 
throwback, and I'm glad it's still going strong. I'm delighted to be in Kansas City where I've never been. I've traveled from New York with my dear friend, Judge Tom Grisey. He's from Kansas City. He's had, he's had a big judicial career in New York, but he's from Kansas City. And it occurred to me that with his wife, Chris, he has a mixed marriage because she's from St. Louis. And so I, <laughs> I suppose that's uh, permitted. Um, but <clears throat> I, I must say that the Nobel Peace Prize is a really, well, it's a great topic. It's a fascinating and rich topic. And I say it not because I've written a book on it. It just is. And a writer can only mess it up. I was, I was aware of this when I was writing my book. Uh, it's such great material, it just falls in your lap. <clears throat> and I'll tell you uh, why, a few reasons I found the subject so interesting. First, if you study the Nobel Peace Prize, you get an overview, a survey of the 20th century, and now, of course, more than a decade into the 21st. The Nobel Peace Prize, like the other Nobel Prizes, begins in 1901. So you really go through everything. Uh, you have the era of pacifism and progressivism, and then World War I, then the Depression, World War II, uh, the Cold War, and so-called hot wars within the Cold War in Korea, Vietnam, Latin America, Africa, other places, the Middle East, South African apartheid, environmentalism, uh, the war on terror, uh, the age of Obama, all of these things come up in the Nobel Peace Prize. So it's an interesting way and, and a neat, rather quick way of looking at the 20th century and our part of the 21st century. Plus, there's this great, diverse, colorful cast of characters, mainly the laureates, some 100 of them, 110. It depends on how you count. There are also institutions as well as individuals. But as I say in my book, there's not a dullard in the bunch. I mean, they're all interesting. Uh, as I was writing my book, it was getting longer than I thought, and I mentioned this to certain writer friends of mine with worry, and they said, well, just skip over the uninteresting ones and concentrate on the interesting ones, but they're all interesting, really. Some of them are rogues, some of them are saints. Uh, bear in mind, this is a piece that, this is a prize, a peace prize that, that, that both Mother Teresa and Yasser Arafat have won. That's a strange kind of prize. <laughs> And another thing a study of this prize does is force you to confront some of the biggest issues, the biggest issues we have to deal with. War and peace, freedom and tyranny. How do you keep the peace? What's the relation between freedom and peace? And uh, you have to confront these things, and the rubber hits the road, so to speak. And I had to decide uh, what I really believed about these things, certainly in these Nobel cases. Uh, Norman Podhoritz, the great writer and editor, says, you have to pull the trigger at some point. Um, you remember Harry Truman who asked for um, a one-handed economist because they were always saying, on one hand, on the other hand, on my third <laughs> hand, on my fourth hand. And so <clears throat> I, I write a, a history. Uh, it's basically chronological, although there are excursions. But at the end, and I, what I think, I haven't looked at the book in a while, I call it an epilogue. I, I let a all hang out, or some of it hang out, and say what I myself believe. Well, of course, um, <clears throat> acknowledging the, the validity of, of other opinions. So it's a really juicy subject. And uh, the subtitle of my book is The Most Famous and Controversial Prize in the World. And I think it's indisputable that the Nobel Peace Prize is the most controversial prize, because the idea of peace is so controversial. What is peace? What constitutes peace? Real peace. What is peacemaking? Uh, who qualifies as a peacemaker? And who should be crowned uh, the foremost peacemaker in all the world for a given year? And so it, it's, uh, I believe, uh, undoubtedly the most controversial. But when I say the most famous, it might be a bit of a fudge, because the Nobel Peace Prize is possibly tied with, or maybe even slightly surpassed by, the Academy Award. Or I don't know how you would measure this. Uh, you'd have to have some sort of global gallop. I don't know. I'd say they're probably the two most famous awards in the world. And something really strange happened in 2007. And that year, one man won both the Oscar and the Nobel Peace Prize, and that was Al Gore. Now, this is a bit of a fudge as well, because Gore's movie won Best Documentary. He himself didn't win it individually, but close enough, as far as I'm concerned. And he did share the Nobel Peace Prize with the UN Climate 
panel uh, later in the year. So if you're going to lose the presidency in such a hard and bitter way, the Oscar and the Nobel Peace Prize provide a kind of bomb. And, and he said as much. <clears throat> he said as much. I figured we should <clears throat> know something about the guy who started this all, the testator, as we call him, the writer of the will, Alfred Nobel. I so enjoyed getting to know him. Uh, he was a, a great man. Uh, he was at least as impressive as anyone who has ever won his prizes. He was a Swede, although he was a quite cosmopolitan man, did most of his growing up in St. Petersburg, the imperial capital of Russia. He was a chemist and chemical engineer, probably a genius, had 355 patents to his name. Some of his inventions are quite important. His most famous invention is dynamite. But we know from scientists who know about these things, and I'm not one of them, uh, that is not his most impressive or significant invention. Uh, that was something else. <clears throat> anyway, a very smart and industrious guy, and a genius entrepreneur and businessman. He presided over an empire of uh, 90 facilities, factories and so on, all over the world, in Europe and here in the United States. And he traveled among these places uh, all the time. In fact, Victor Hugo called him Europe's wealthiest vagabond. <laughs> and <clears throat> you will sometimes hear that he established his prize for peace out of guilt over his invention of dynamite. Uh, this is not true. Uh, we can't always know what's in a man's head and heart, but from all we know, he was very proud of his achievements in the area of explosives. They built what today we call infrastructure, bridges, canals, tunnels, railroads, Central Pacific Railroad here in the United States, uh, for example. He thought that his inventions were of great utility to mankind. And he said there's nothing in the world that can't be abused. <clears throat> Plus, he was a great believer in deterrence, uh, the idea that terrible weapons would prevent or even abolish war. He was an over-believer in this. And if he'd lived a little longer into the 20th century, certainly uh, seeing the first war, he wouldn't have had those views. Uh, he contained multitudes. He had many views that depended on the day. Uh, his correspondence is voluminous and fantastic. Uh, a very impressive man. He amassed a great fortune by dint of his own talent and effort. <clears throat> and uh, he was, as they say, unlucky in love and never married. Uh, he had um, great sorrow of his life. He had nieces and nephews and some others to take care of, which he did in his will. But he left the bulk of his estate to these prizes. Now, this will made news and it was unveiled all over the world. Now it's perfectly routine to leave your fortune, I assume we all have one, uh, <coughs> to, to, to leave your fortune to some great public or philanthropic uh, enterprise. It's foundations, it's now normal. But it wasn't then. It wasn't really done much then at the end of the 19th century. And so this will, I guess it's one of the most famous wills uh, ever written. And um, I should tell you what the, the will says about the Peace Prize. The leading criterion uh, for the winner of the Peace Prize is fraternity between nations. Uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the great guiding light, fraternity between nations. That is what is supposed to get the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but as you can figure out, the Nobel Committee has strayed pretty far afield over the years. The way they put it is they expand the definition of peace. And so they've given it to agronomists, and uh, microbankers and global warming campaigners and others. But uh, Nobel in his will wants the prize to go to those who did, I think the phrase is most or best work for fraternity between nations. There are a couple of other criteria, but that's the main one. Now I think I may have to look at notes uh, to know where to go next because <clears throat> as you heard, uh, you know, there's so many laureates and they're so interesting. And I'm gonna touch on just a, a few uh, nobody's really more interesting than Alfred Nobel himself. I suppose you should know who gives the award. It doesn't just fall from the sky. It falls from a committee of five Norwegians. Um, <clears throat> the committee has always been composed of Norwegians and only Norwegians. Uh, Nobel doesn't uh, demand this in his will, but it has been a custom. Uh, they are elected or appointed by the Norwegian parliament, called the Storting. And so, um, this is my line, and some Norwegians object to this, but I, I still think it's true. Uh, the Norwegian people elect the parliament, and the parliament elects the Nobel Committee. Therefore, the Nobel Peace Prize is a reflection 
of the Norwegian people and their political culture. I think this is so. And what is that culture? Well, it's social democratic, largely. It's not red. It's maybe a little pink. Uh, it is largely social democratic. And these aren't necessarily classical liberals. Uh, but uh, sometimes they surprise you in their selections. It's part of what makes a Nobel history fun. But basically, over the generations, these are Scandinavian social democrats. And you see this in the committee's choices. Lately, they've been giving the prize once a year, but they don't have to. The will says you have to give it once in five years. Uh, but, and sometimes in the past, the, the prize was either omitted altogether for a particular year or reserved, is expression, till the next year. That hasn't happened since, I think, 1972. And as someone said, now people expect it to come every year like Christmas. Um, <clears throat> this can be a powerful weapon, the Nobel Peace Prize. It can really change things. It can have a great impact. Sometimes the Peace Prize doesn't really make a ripple, and sometimes it's convulsive. I interviewed uh, Lech Walesa, or Voensa, the winner of the Peace Prize in 1983, and he said that without the Nobel Prize, his solidarity cause in Poland could not have succeeded. It's a very big statement. <clears throat> he, the way he put it was, there was no wind in Poland's sail. He's equating his movement with Poland itself. There was no wind in Poland's sail, and the Nobel Peace Prize put wind in that sail. It's a very big deal. And here's a little inside story, not from me, but from the historian Robert Kagan, who talked with Oscar Arias, who was a president of Costa Rica uh, in the 1980s, and he won the Peace Prize in 1987. And the committee told him privately, we're giving you this prize so you'll have a weapon against Reagan, whom the committee hated. Mm -hmm. And as, um, <clears throat> as Arias told Kagan, Reagan was responsible for my Peace Prize, uh, which is kind of an interesting thought. But um, you might say that East Timor got its independence because of this. The Nobel Peace Prize helped to keep Sakharov alive. It may have helped to keep Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma alive. Uh, it can do a lot, this prize. So going back to the beginning in 1901 and that decade of the aughts, I thought I'd say just a word about pacifism because there came a time, especially after World War II, when the word pacifist acquired an odor, a stigma. And if you say to someone today, you're a pacifist, uh, he might say, who are you calling a pacifist? You know, blah, blah, blah. But if you, at, once upon a time, if you said to someone, you're a pacifist, he might have responded, well, of course I am. What are you, a militarist? Uh, pacifism was posed against militarism. Uh, people, who people who favored peaceful solutions, uh, people who favored uh, the solution of war. Uh, this is way too neat and way too stark. But there was a time when pacifist wasn't a dirty word. And a lot of full-time pacifists uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize, especially in the first decade, the first decade or two, even in the 20s, even in the 30s, full-time pacifists were winning the Peace Prize. But really not since the war, not since World War II. And the grand exception of that first decade, as you heard, was Teddy Roosevelt, no pacifist. Uh, he was the first statesman to win the award. This was 1906, and the first American. And he won it chiefly, though not only, for his mediation in the Russo-Japanese War. And this mediation culminated in the Portsmouth Treaty, it's Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in September 1905. This was before air conditioning, and Roosevelt did not spend the summer in Washington, D.C., uh, where his temporary home was. He spent, it, uh, he spent the summers on his yacht off of New England, and he invited the parties to uh, meet him there, and they did, and they signed that treaty in um, New Hampshire. And a lot of people at the time were very upset over this award to TR. And it still rankles some people, especially what I call professional Nobel people, people who work at the Norwegian Nobel Institute uh, in Oslo and at the Nobel Institute in Stockholm. And I can quote, I think from memory, what the New York Times said in 1906 when President Roosevelt got this award. Uh, the editor said, a broad smile must have illuminated the face of the globe when this glittering award for peace was given to the most warlike citizen of these United States. Um, they, they weren't very happy. And <clears throat> I thought it might be fun, if nothing else, to mention one of those Coolidge guys, uh, the Vice President um, Charles Dawes, uh, Brigadier General Charles Dawes, Vice President. He was Coolidge's <coughs> Vice President, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize in the mid-1920s, not for anything having to do with the Coolidge administration, but for his leadership of what was called the Dawes Commission. Uh, this set new terms for German reparations. It was very important. But some of you may know him, whether you know him or not, 
uh, for another reason. He was an amateur musician. He was a pianist and flutist and composer. And in 1912, he wrote a little piece called Melody in A, which sold quite a bit. And Fritz Kreisler used it as an encore and recorded it. So Dawes dies in 1951, and the lyricist Carl Sigmund takes this tune uh, and uh, makes a song out of it, a pop song. It's all in the game, which was a huge hit for Tommy Edwards and a million other people covered it. Now, we can go back to other laureates, uh, certainly in the Q&A, but let's jump way ahead to the most controversial Nobel Prize, not just Peace Prize, but any Nobel Prize ever given. That was in 1973. And uh, that year, the Nobel Peace Prize is shared by the American Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, and the North Vietnamese envoy, Le Duc Tho. And they won the award for the Paris Agreement, which was supposed to be a ceasefire in the Vietnam War, signed in January 73, immediately violated by the North, of course. And I think it's very telling that the reason this Peace Prize is so notorious and controversial and condemned <coughs> is that uh, half of it was given to Kissinger, the American Secretary of State. I think it's remarkable that a representative of a mass murdering totalitarian dictatorship was given half of the Nobel Peace Prize. But you may recall a once famous statement by Tom Lehrer, the once famous satirist, that political satire became impossible after the award was given to Henry Kissinger. Uh, Sakharov did win in 1975. Quite true. A very, very surprising award. Uh, I was able to talk to his widow about it, Elena Bonner. She has since died. I wonder why they gave it to him. Um, he was, of course, a very great man, a great physicist, a great Democrat with a small d, a great human rights campaigner. One of the greatest men in the whole ugly history of the Soviet Union, along with Solzhenitsyn, who won the Literature Prize, by the way. No worries, it's all right. No worries at all. Solzhenitsyn won the Literature Prize, uh, but not the Peace Prize. Sakharov won the Peace Prize in 1975. The Soviet government refused to let him out to go get it. Elena Bonner got it, though, in Oslo. She was out of the country anyway for medical treatment uh, in Italy. Fascinating, brave, fierce, cantankerous woman, Elena Bonner. But in the long history of the Soviet Union, 1917 and 1991, only two people in the general anti-Soviet cause uh, were given the Nobel Peace Prize. That was Sakharov in 1975 and Walesa or Vawensa in 1983 but a very gratifying award in 1975, and it embarrassed the Soviet government, and it probably helped to keep Sakharov alive. And he died just before the Soviet Union collapsed, um, but it was on its way. So speaking of that, Gorbachev wins in 1990. Uh, this is another greatly controversial award. There are people, there are such extreme views about this award. Some people think it was an abomination and they're really thinking of the uh, suppression and killing in the, in, in the Baltics in early 1991. Very, very light suppression and killing by Soviet standards, but it did happen. And there are other people who think it's the most earned Nobel Peace Prize ever given. Uh, that's a view of, for example, um, uh, John Gaddis, the Cold War historian. Frankly, I, I buy a little bit of each view. I know that sounds strange, uh, but I thought the person who put it best was, again, uh, Walesa. Now, uh, this is very crude, uh, mind you, but you know, I'm reminded that Balesa is uh, an electrician and labor leader, and he talks straight and blunt. And I said to him, uh, why do you think they gave the Peace Prize to General Secretary Gorbachev? He said, because he had the instruments of rape and didn't use them. He could have done what his predecessors did, for example, in Prague in 1968 and Budapest in 1956 and East Berlin in 1953 and so on, he could have crushed dissent and rebellion in Eastern Europe, and he didn't. He, in a way, let the people go. And I think that's right. I don't really begrudge Gorbachev his Nobel Peace Prize. I, and as, as Walesa says, if it meant the end of the Soviet Union, fine. Uh, a lot of people were upset, especially American conservatives, that Reagan didn't win the prize along with uh, Gorbachev in 1990. Um, I can tell you hell would have frozen over <laughs> before the Norwegian Nobel Committee uh, gave uh, even half of a prize uh, to Reagan. But I have a couple of sections in my book on uh, so-called missing laureates, those who might have won the Peace Prize but didn't. Uh, Gandhi, uh, as you heard, is the outstanding peace figure of the 20th century. He didn't win the prize for various reasons. We could get into it. 
He probably would have won in 1948, uh, but he was uh, murdered earlier that year in January, and the committee didn't give a prize for 1948 at all. They just <laughs> let it stand. And some people think that 1948 is, in a way, Gandhi's prize. At the time, the committee didn't think that the will allowed them to give a posthumous award. They changed their mind one time. They gave it to their fellow Scandinavian, Dag Hammarskjöld, uh, the UN uh, Secretary General who died in a plane crash. This was in the early 1960s. But then the rules changed, and they haven't done it since. So uh, Gandhi didn't get the prize. Uh, who else? Herbert Hoover was very, very heavily nominated for his work in food relief in World War I, and also after World War II. Hoover lived and worked and wrote a very, very long time. Andrew Carnegie gave a lot of money in the cause of peace. Uh, didn't win the Peace Prize, although a lot of his friends did. Later on, Václav Havel, the Czech, didn't win it. Uh, might have. Uh, Cory Aquino in the Philippines didn't win it. We all have our favorite so-called missing laureates. Uh, they give it once a year. You can give it to three people max at a time. And it is true, you can't give it to everyone. It is true. But they did give it to Rigoberta Menchu. Um, there was a time when many, many students were made to read her memoir, I, Rigoberta Menchu. She was a famous, uh, they called her a peasant revolutionary and memoirist from Guatemala. She won in 1992. And, and, and why 1992? That was a big anniversary year. It was the 500th anniversary of what we used to call Columbus's discovery of America. And, and the Nobel <laughs> Committee uh, looked for the most famous uh, native in all of the Americas and found Rigoberta Menchu in order to poke Columbus in the eye, gave the award to Menchu in 1992. <clears throat> and then comes Arafat. And as I was writing my book, sometimes people would say, hey, what are you doing? I'd say, I'm writing a book on the Nobel Peace Prize. And they'd look funny and they'd say, uh, didn't they give it to Arafat? <laughs> like it's all they needed to know, that like no more needed to be said. <laughs> but, but, now, this is a prize, listen, it's not so clear cut. It's well to remember that he did not win the prize alone. He won it in concert with two Israeli statesmen, the prime minister and the foreign minister, who were happy or at least willing to join hands with Arafat in Oslo and accept this 1994 Nobel Peace Prize. And their accords and their process were named after the committee's own city, Oslo. Now, um, there was a member of the committee, uh, a committee member who resigned, his name was uh, Christensen, I think, Cora Christensen. And uh, I think I probably would have been uh, with him. Uh, he just couldn't stomach even a third of a Peace Prize going to Arafat. But I do think that the other four uh, had a case. Uh, so there is some gray in this award to Arafat. And by the way, the foreign minister, Shimon Peres, went, went so far in his Nobel lecture to say that Arafat's share in the prize was fitting. So there's that. And now we're in the mid-90s, jump just into the 2000s. Jimmy Carter gets the Nobel Peace Prize. And the Nobel chairman makes a very interesting statement to the press. He said, um, this prize is intended to be a kick in the leg to all who follow the current administration and its line. In other words, the George W. Bush administration. Kick in the leg is a Norwegian expression for slap in the face, poke in the eye, uh, et cetera. And it was a very blunt admission. It was not just a a pro-Carter award, it was an anti-Bush award. And you could argue that there were fully five of these during Bush 43's two terms. Uh, so in 2001, the award goes to the United Nations and uh, Kofi Annan, then the um, <coughs> Secretary General, jointly. Now I believe the prize would have gone to the UN anyway, um, because it was the centennial year of the Nobel Prizes, and the Nobel Committee likes nothing more than to honor the United Nations. And before the United Nations, the League of Nations, and before the League, what was called the IPU, or Interparliamentary Union. This is what the Nobel Committee does. Uh, but this award, and the award's always announced in the fall, normally the second Friday in October, but not always. So this award in 2001 was announced and probably determined, I, I don't know. The records are unsealed 50 years later, right after 9-11. And so this is some kind of warning to, in fact, they said as much the committee did to President Bush uh, to involve the United Nations in the war on terror. So that's 2001. 2002, Carter wins, kick in the leg. 2005, the award goes to the International Atomic Energy Agency and its then Director General, Mohammed al-Baradeh. 2007, Gore and the Intergovernmental 
panel on climate change, and 2009, uh, President Obama. And <clears throat> I have a rather long section in my book. The book more or less culminates in the award to President Obama. People want to know why the committee gave it to Obama. And uh, my answer could be very long, but I'll make it quite short. Um, Obama was the committee's kind of president. Uh, as I say in my book, I think, if the, if the people on the committee could design an American president from scratch, the president would turn out a lot like Barack Obama. He's one of them in a way, a kindred spirit, who views the world more or less as, as, as they do. But there were some Nobel people who were upset at this war to Obama because he was, after all, commander in chief in what were then two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. And in his Nobel lecture, he defended the Afghan war mightily. Very, very interesting address. And, and the award to, to Obama, I find a very interesting uh, episode in Nobel history. Uh, it was a surprise. And I remember when I woke up that Friday morning, because you know, Norway is way ahead of us in, in, in hours, and, and saw that it was Obama. I was surprised. And I thought about it more, and I said, you're, really, you're supposed to know about the Nobel Peace Prize. You really shouldn't be. But a very interesting award. Um, you know, when someone talks about the Nobel Peace Prize and other things, of course, um, you, you learn uh, as much about the guy talking as you do about the subject. <laughs> and we all have biases, prejudices, uh, um, as, as my grandmother used to say, idiot syncrasies. Uh, and so I, I, <clears throat> I have my own views, surely. And I think in the epilogue of my book, when I sort of let it all hang out and, and, and uh, abandon the tone of neutral or semi-neutral historian, I say what I regard as the main errors of the Nobel Committee over the generations. And so I'll give them to you for what they're worth. Um, first of all, the committee has had a very strong belief, almost a, almost a blind belief, in disarmament. Uh, disarmament as a benefit to peace. I do not have that belief. I think history tells us something else. I, am, I think that history tells us something else about, the, about deterrence and to use an old slogan, peace through strength. And there are some people who have the notion that the fewer the arms, the more the peace, the better the chances for peace. I think this is a major error and, and the Nobel Committee very often uh, repeats it. Then there's this near absolute attachment to the United Nations and other multilateral organizations. <clears throat> That the Norwegians are convinced that these things are a great force for peace. I am not. Uh, during the Cold War, I don't know if you remember the phrase moral equivalence, the idea that the democratic West and the communist East were more or less equal. Sure, over on our side, we have political rights, you know, rights to speech and worship and assembly and all that. But, you know, they have social rights and no one goes hungry and everyone has glorious health care and shelter and so on. All nonsense. But this is a very strong view. I was certainly taught it when I was in high school and college during the Cold War. And it's something the committee always believed and uh, I regard it as an error. Uh, now come to the war on terror. There is a belief <clears throat> that um, poverty is a cause of, of, of terrorism. I myself find this not only untrue but offensive, certainly offensive to the poor most of whom have never had a murderous thought in their lives, much less acted on it. And finally, there's this business of you know, peace, peace, where there's no peace, sham peace, pretend peace. And I think the most withering criticism of the Nobel Peace Prize I've ever heard uh, came not from me, but from Tony Blair. And it was a private remark, but George W. Bush publicized it in his memoirs. Blair was going off on another round of Middle East diplomacy. And he said to Bush, if I win the Nobel Peace Prize, you'll know I failed. Now that is a very cynical view, but Blair, but, 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 but Blair expressed it. But there was something to what he said, something to what he said. Um, I, there's a parlor game that's fun to play. Uh, I'll be the only player at the moment, but that is what is the best and what is the worst Nobel Peace Prize. I thought the question might come up, and I thought a, a lot about it as I wrote my book, and, and I gave an opinion again in the epilogue and I'll share it with you. Not that you asked, although you, you, you might have later. Um, <clears throat> and when it comes to the best Nobel Peace Prize, uh, what I say is in playing this game, allow me to set aside the heroes of freedom, human rights, and democracy. Because should they win a Peace Prize or something more like a, a Freedom Prize? What is the purpose of a Peace Prize? So allow me to lay aside Sakharov, uh, Walesa, Albert John Latuli, the great South African anti-apartheid leader, 
uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, Liu Xiaobo, uh, set them to one side. They're all great. And also, set aside the humanitarians and living saints, because once you mention the name Mother Teresa, all bets are off. You know, <laughs> well, what a great woman. She would, I was very interested to, to immerse myself, and immerse is too big a word, to look over her life once more. And because, you know, reputations sometimes get inflated and there's a lot of hype. You know, she really was great. It, it reminds me of what the um, poet Robert Graves said a long time ago. He said, you know, the thing about Shakespeare is he really is good, you know, despite the fact that everyone thinks so. <laughs> the Mother Teresa really was great, and colossally great. Uh, but um, just take the terms of the will. Who has done the best or most work for fraternity between nations? I don't think you can beat Sadat and Begin in 1978, I mean, Egypt and Israel had fought four wars, or to put it another way, uh, Egypt had triggered four wars against mm -hmm. Israel, wars of annihilation. And now Sadat, uh, in a very precarious situation, was reaching out for peace for his own reasons. The Israelis were embracing this. There was some skepticism. And uh, they signed a peace treaty, sh final, shortly after the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded. This is in March 1979. And that peace has held. It has been a cold peace at times. Uh, there have been periods when Egypt has withheld an ambassador uh, from Israel. And now, of course, the peace treaty is very much in question with the upheaval in Egypt. But it has stuck for almost 35 years. That is a really big deal. And I can't think of a more worthy peace prize, if you go by Nobel's concept for his own peace prize, fraternity between nations. Also, uh, the prize um, later on in the late 1990s to the people who forged the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. Now that's, I say, you know, between nations. This was an intra-Northern Ireland thing, but close enough. That has stuck too. There have been some outbreaks of something very, very much unlike peace. But that has more or less stuck. And uh, that was, that was a, a Nobel style, an Alfred Nobel style award. By the way, <clears throat> Um, in 1960, the aforementioned Chief Lutuli, this great South African who was both a Zulu chief and an early leader of the ANC, um, he was the first to win uh, the Nobel Peace Prize for an internal struggle, a freedom struggle within one nation. And of course, many, many followed. So the worst Nobel Prize, in my opinion, and again, my opinion, and other people playing the game will have their own opinions, I would say as a class, uh, the worst Nobel Prizes have been those who've gone to disarmers, especially unilateral disarmers, because of my beliefs about war and peace and deterrence and appeasement and accommodation and all the rest of it. Uh, Nobel Peace Prizes to disarmers before World War II in the face of the Nazi buildup, uh, and then during the Cold War to people like Albert Myrdal, just to take one uh, of a great many. I think these Nobel Prizes were very much misguided. <clears throat> but I'll tell you what I think the worst Nobel Prize is. It's a very recent one, 2005. Now, it's true I may think this because I know our own period so well. I know our own period, even if I'm wrong, I mean, I, I know the events of my own period <clears throat> so well, and I know the aughts and the teens and the 20s and 30s less well. Still, I think I would have this opinion. In 2005, the award goes to the International Atomic Energy Agency in uh, Vienna <clears throat> and its Director General, Mohammed El-Baradeh, the Egyptian. And <clears throat> here's, my, here's my rap, here's my spiel. Um, on the eve of the Gulf War in 1991, the IAEA assured everyone that Iraq was in compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. In fact, Saddam Hussein's regime sat on the board of the IAEA, the Board of Governors, from 1980 right up until the eve of the Gulf War. I think, I think the day the Gulf War began, January 16, 1991. Afterward, the then Director General of the IEA, Hans Blick, said, we were fooled by the Iraqis. <clears throat> For 20 years, they missed the Iranian nuclear program. We learned about it not from the IAEA, but from dissidents, from whistleblowers. Fine, people make mistakes. You can't see the fall of every sparrow, blah, blah, blah. But I believe after <clears throat> the Iranian program was revealed, uh, al Baradei in particular did a lot to shield the Iranian regime from sanctions and uh, of course from military attack. I heard in my own ears, I'd hear Al-Baradeh at, at, at Davos conferences saying, I don't want to report violations to the Security Council because that would trigger sanctions and I'm against sanctions. And he grossly politicized the agency and I think he has a lot to answer for. Now, you may think that my view of Al-Baradeh and the IEA is too hard, that they're not as 
bumbling and culpable and harmful as I think they are, fine. But to win the Nobel Peace Prize, the world, according to the Oxford uh, World Dictionary, the most prestigious prize in all the world, why? I believe it was just a taunt. I believe it was a ha-ha directed at the Bush administration for the failure to find WMD in Iraq ready to go on the shelf after the 2003 invasion. I think that's the reason for the 2005 prize, and especially if Iran goes nuclear, or I might say when Iran goes nuclear, I think that award will look very, very bad, ignominious. <clears throat> I also thought for my book, for the end of it, I mean, I'm very opinionated in this talk. The book is not as opinionated. I thought about what my favorite peacemaker, is there some kind of ideal peacemaker? And I love George C. Marshall, General Marshall, who was Chief of Staff of the Army during the war, World War II, and who was later, of course, Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense. <clears throat> My kind of peacemaker, because he confronted evil in the form of Nazism, for example, with arms when he had to, and then after the war went about doing everything he could to bolster the peace through the Marshall Plan, which is why he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1953, Churchill won the Literature Prize, by the way, that same year in Stockholm, 1953. Uh, Churchill never won the uh, Peace Prize. Now, you might think that the defeat of Nazism was a great blow for the cause of peace, but that's not why Marshall won the award. He won the award for the Marshall Plan. He was the only one not to call it that. He was too modest. He called it by its formal name, the European Recovery Program. No one knew what he was talking about, because to everyone else it was the Marshall Plan. Uh, but he was an extraordinary figure. And um, <clears throat> I think I'll tell this story because um, people who have read my book um, seem to be so moved by it. Uh, it's, uh, I forget how many pages of the book there are, but so many people have read it say, I want to tell you something that I really liked in the book. I could almost predict it. It's a nice story, so I'll, I'll go ahead and tell it. Marshall was a very self-abnegating man, a very modest man. I mean, really so, not just for show. And in, oh, this is interesting. Didn't we have just a couple of weeks ago my math is not so fast, the 60th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth II's reign. Anyway, Marshall was the American representative, probably of Eisenhower personally, at her coronation in the summer, I think it was June 19, yeah, June, yeah, we're in June, June 1953. And he, and so, oh, well, I should have said he was revered on the continent of Europe and in the British Isles, maybe not so much in Ireland, revered for what he did during the war. He's almost everyone's favorite person. And so he enters Westminster Abbey, just alone, no entourage, no nobody. And um, walking, he notices that the congregation has stood. And he looks behind him to see who's entered. And it was just, <laughs> it was just he. And, and then there was this grand procession. This is not in my book. I was trying to make it as short as possible. There's this grand procession, including the queen, or the queen-to-be, the princess, and all the others. And uh, three people broke ranks, as I recall. This is, you know, it's a very formal thing, a, a royal coronation in London. It's not all loosey-goosey and freelance, you know. Uh, but Churchill and Alan Brooke and I believe Montgomery actually swerved out of the way to greet Marshall in his seat and then resumed. Uh, he was a great man. I may have a couple of closing thoughts before I hear your thoughts and questions. Uh, I thought that I should decide for myself and for readers if they're interested. And one thing that is true about this book, I think, is that um, it gives you information that allows you to know what you think of the Nobel Peace Prize and its winners, forgetting what I think. Uh, this book, I think that's what a good movie review does, for example. Forget what the critic thinks. You know, would I like it? I think a review should say that. I think this book is, 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 is like that. But I thought I should decide for myself, is the Nobel Peace Prize, worth it? Does it do more good than harm? And I, this is not what I intended to say, but I just, I just thought of it. I was in Oslo once outside the Vigeland Sculpture Park, which is a great um, place in, in, in Oslo. And I was buying a, vo a book from a, a vendor. And I said to him, because I was in repertorial mode, what do you think of the Nobel Peace Prize? And he said, first he answered as a Norwegian. He said, well, it put Norway on the map. <laughs> and really, Nor Norway is known for the Nobel Peace Prize. They've got that, they've got Sonia Henney, they, they've, they've got a few others. But um, he said, but you know, I think, I don't always agree with the committee's decision, but it's probably good to have a prize for peace along with a prize for many other things under the sun. And I thought, it's put very, very simply. And I thought, 
I agree. <clears throat> and I'll tell you about my own, this is, this, this is a sort of personal emotional view, as though I'm on Oprah on the couch saying, Oprah, this is how I feel. <laughs> well, <clears throat> in the Literature Prize, just as I'm ready to give out the Literature Prize, they'll award that thing to five, six, seven, eight ideological hacks in a row. And I'll think, good. I never have to think about the Literature Prize again for the rest of my life. It's off my radar. It, it's dead to me, the Literature Prize. And then they trip you up by giving it to you know, Solzhenitsyn or Saul Bellow or V.S. Naipaul or Mario Vargas Llosa. And you think, oh, I have to pay attention for a few more years. <laughs> Just when I'm ready to write off the Nobel Peace Prize, they do something noble and important. Take the 2010 award to the Chinese prisoner of conscience, Liu. Now, they've been passing over the Chinese for 60 years. By the way, you know this line from Bob Hope? He's hosting the Oscars. And he says, welcome to the Oscars, or as we call it in my house, Passover. But he had, they, 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 they had passed over the Chinese for 60 years. Um, the communists seized power in 1948, and horrific things are all sorts of Chinese freedom fighters and prisoners of conscience and so on, and they will not anger the Chinese government the Nobel Committee won't. 60 years, and they, w people kept expecting, uh, especially Wei Jing Sheng, to win the award. And he was, um, in fact, his name appeared in three consecutive Nobel lectures. Because it's sort of like when you win the Oscar, you, you, the other nominees, you think, oh, but you know, Bill and Jack and Joe were there, just great. You know, and Nobel winners do this too. They hail people in their speeches who didn't win. So this, this, this one Chinese dissident was mentioned in the 1990s in three Nobel lectures in a row. And I should say, though, that the, 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 the Norwegian Nobel Committee did something rather gutty in 1989. They did award the Nobel Peace Prize to the Tibetan leader, the, uh, the Dalai Lama. That is true. But um, so it took them a long while, but they, but they gave this award to, to Liu in 2010. And um, it hasn't sprung him from prison. Uh, in fact, as you heard, his relatives are being arrested. But he is better known than he was. He's better known than he was. And um, I will wrap up with this. I, when I was working, in, I'm, I'm, I'm a Reaganite. I'm a National Review senior editor. And when I was working on my book, I, I got sort of sick of peace. Talk about peace, prattle about peace, peace this, claims of peace, false peace. You know, when, when someone talks about peace, you know, pr protect your wallet. You know, peace is such a, <laughs> peace, peace is such a racket. But real peace, real peace, well, what, true peace, Thatcher used to say peace with freedom. Eisenhower said um, peace is the climate of freedom. Or perhaps the other way around. I'll have to read my book. But real peace is worth the Nobel Peace Prize and a lot more. And uh, I, I have a great many thoughts about peace, not from me, but from others in my book. Uh, but one, I, and many are, several are from the Bible. That's a very good book on the subject of peace, as on other subjects. It's really worth reading the Bible, actually. <laughs> <clears throat> but I thought of a line from George Orwell in his novel, Coming Up for, uh, for Air. The, narr the narrator says, um, um, uh, before the war, meaning World War I, and especially before the Boer War, meaning the Second Boer War, um, when there was peace, it was summer all the year round. I thought, you know, peace is a kind of permanent summer. So uh, you're so nice to have come, and uh, let's have Q&A. Thank you. Thank you.